Okay, that's, that's so all being well, that's visible. And thank you ever so much. Thank you, Susan. And thanks for this opportunity to, to meet with you all, albeit virtually, as we've just been talking about. Um, this is uh, one of the, I suppose, upsides of our current uh, pandemic situation is having this opportunity um, to use these search sorts of virtual media um, to, to talk to each other. And uh, it's amazing that I'm sitting here in uh, Northern Ireland across the North Channel and uh, you know, looking into people's uh, um, uh, dining rooms and living rooms and people sitting there comfortably, all being well. I hope you're sitting there comfortably with a cup of tea or coffee or something stronger uh, as, as you wish. And uh, uh, join me on this uh, ramble through the Landscape Archaeology Survey um, over the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Delighted you're, you're able to join me and join us in this. Uh, I hope you find it interesting. And uh, as, I, as uh, Susan said at the start, uh, we'll be looking forward to some discussion. If anybody has any questions towards the end, I'll be only too happy to try and answer them. So my uh, talk is called Mapping Monuments, um, a Landscape Archaeology of the Ordnance Survey. And it uh, reflects some work I've been doing now for quite a number of years. Um, partly on the island of Ireland, but not only on the island of Ireland, also uh, in, in Great Britain as well. So what you're going to hear about this evening is a little bit about some of the results of that work. But also, also as Susan was hinting at, um, plans afoot uh, for hopefully better times in 2021 and the possibility of um, getting over to Scotland for me and uh, undertaking some field work. Uh, in the Highlands, all being well, uh, with, with uh, Arch, with Susan, with colleagues, um, exploring the landscape archaeologies of the Ordnance Survey in your part of the world, assuming you are in Scotland, and I can't necessarily assume that because on the great World Wide Web, some people could be absolutely anywhere, of course. Wherever you are, you're very welcome. Um, so I'm talking to you uh, from Northern Ireland. I'm based at Queen's University Belfast, and I run a... Um, uh, a, a heritage hub, which is really a way of connecting communities, the wider community, with the academic research community and universities uh, through a shared interest in heritage. So I, I'm speaking to you in that sort of capacity today. So uh, I thought I'd start off actually because I can see some of you may, may be able to see me on the camera, but if this isn't too self-indulgent, um, just to start off with this particular set of images. Um, and some letters, which uh, I don't know actually, and uh, might may not be visible to see uh, the letters there. But uh, in 1978, yes, that's May 1978. Uh, I was, I think, about 10 or 11 at that particular point in time. Um, so I didn't look like the image on the right. That is to say, I looked like the person with the hair in the image on the bottom left, standing on that, uh, sitting on that dolman in Wiltshire. And in 1978, I wrote to the Ordnance Survey. Uh, no less, because uh, I was interested in getting hold of some Ordnance Survey maps for where I lived, which is then in Coventry. And uh, I was written back uh, by a W.J. Harris from Information Branch at the Ordnance Survey. And uh, he wrote a little note to my dad as well at the time. It says, Keith writes a good letter and seems like a grand lad. And I, and I still got that letter, you know. So this interest I have in looking at uh, maps, looking at landscapes, is one which has occupied me for quite a large part of my life, it has to be said. Uh, and, and in my professional capacity as a, as a historical geographer, that's my, my discipline is historical geography, um, I'm very fortunate to be able to continue that interest um, professionally uh, by getting outdoors and, and visiting the sites and monuments of the Ordnance Survey. The image on the right comes from uh, British Archaeology, which is journal for the Council for British Archaeology, which had a little article I wrote a few years ago on this topic called Surveying the Surveyors. I'm, I'm stood there on Cadiadris. Some of you may, know, may uh, recognize that. Uh, that's the view from Cadiadris. So a life in maps, you know, is something very close to my heart. And I kind of assume it's also something that's close to all of your hearts as well. And maps are really something I think can get us all very excited about. And in the last, let's face it, the last year, it's been a salvation to us, you know, when, when it's not been possible to actually get out there, uh, enjoy the landscapes and enjoy that uh, right to roam, which of course is there for, for you in Scotland and not so 
unfortunately for us here in Ireland, um, but to get out there and to use our Warden Survey maps, to open up those maps on the, on the table and just to plot and dream and plan of routes of places we might go when things are rather better. So land maps take us on journeys to landscape, through landscapes, you know, whether real or imagined, um, and they're fascinating things. And I think it's fair to say uh, there's a lot of passion for them. And what I want to try and do in this next 40 minutes or so is uh, open up the map uh, and a little um, to look behind the folds, to look behind the map, to think about the processes that were important in creating these maps, not so much the production of the final map as a printed thing, uh, which we use today, many of us still like our printed maps, but to actually journey to the field and follow in the footsteps of those surveyors uh, of 200 years ago in these islands who were busily surveying landscapes and sometimes rather difficult terrain, uh, all of which and all of that information then fed into ultimately into the maps which we enjoy today. And those legacies are still visible in the landscape and they're also still visible on our Ordnance Survey maps. So this is a, a, a talk about maps and landscapes, of connecting maps and landscapes. Um, and partly that will involve actually virtually visiting some of those landscapes, so using maps, but also uh, visiting virtually. And we're so fortunate in the 21st century to have so much uh, available to us, assuming, of course, we have good bandwidth and we have good internet access, but there is a huge amount of online material. This is GeoHive from the Irish, from the Orphan Survey of Ireland. Um, so this is looking at uh, Sleuth Snacks. Uh, in a show in Peninsula in County Donegal in the north of uh, the Republic of Ireland. Um, and, and so these virtual, these online tools, these, uh, these virtual mapping resources enable us to journey across time and space, actually. Um, so we're looking here at uh, the aerial imagery of Sleeve Snacks, and I want you just to look at the very centre of that image, and you'll see a couple of what look like elliptical enclosures. I think on the next slide, you can see a little bit more closely there what we're looking at. Um, this is one of the disadvantages of, of online. I'm not sure if I can use my arrow here to indicate uh, where these features are. Uh, a couple of elliptical enclosures, and then just a little bit away from those, as it were, to the north, uh, another some structures there, uh, one which is more square shaped and one which is more round. So this is the summit of Sleeve Snacks. And I'm curious about these structures. I'm curious about the fact that they've been almost really forgotten about, archaeologically speaking. Uh, certainly in Ireland and for large parts of Britain as well. Um, so what are these structures? What were they used for? Uh, and why are they important? And I think they are important to us today. And this is something which has fascinated me over the past few years in my uh, academic uh, capacity, um, interested in connecting maps and landscapes. And what I'm going to talk about today really draws out some of what I've learned, some of, some of what I found out. Uh, but also pointers as to some of the things which still need to be looked at. Um, I still yet to climb to the summit of Sleeve Snack, uh, but I fully intend to do so uh, to explore some of those structures. And I'm going to explain what I think some of those structures actually are uh, and what uh, their significance is. So this, the talk itself, um, I'm hoping, hoping this is not looking too ambitious actually uh, in the time available. Um, uh, so what I'm going to say first of all is a few words by way of sort of background and context, really, um, about the early Ordnance Survey. I'm really going to be focusing on the early 19th century, so you know, around uh, 200 years ago, so the work of the early Ordnance Survey. And what I'd like to try and do um, is connect our islands, really, is to connect, connect our nations, to look at the Ordnance Survey uh, in Scotland and its operations and also in Ireland. And that's going to be a theme that really runs right the way through this talk. It's really composed then of three main parts. Um, the first part is trying to define what we might mean by an archaeology of the Ordnance Survey. Uh, and I'm going to do that really in two ways, looking at material cultures in both of those, because material culture really is germane to archaeology, is it not? Uh, and this relates really to the act, to the uh, looking behind the map I mentioned a moment ago, to what really lies behind a map, the field survey practices of the Ordnance Survey of 200 years ago. Uh, and in particular, the instruments that were being used in the field for field survey, and also the infrastructures, the actual uh, physical monuments, if you like, 
um, which were created in the landscape to support the field surveying processes. So that's what I'm going to try and use to try and define the archaeology of the different survey. And then the next part is on really how we might begin ourselves to go about exploring uh, material cultures through landscapes of survey, of actually entering ourselves into the field, albeit virtually, of course, uh, at this point in time. Uh, and for me to kind of set out how it might be possible to begin to bring together um, some field evidence to help us to understand the legacies of the Ordnance Survey surveyors uh, in the landscapes around us today in Ireland and in uh, Britain as well. And then I'm going to close the talk fairly briefly with some pointers to the future, uh, flagging up first of all the bicentenary of the survey in Scotland and Ireland and how the opportunity is there for us in the next two to three years um, to draw together uh, the, uh, the shared histories and the shared heritage of the Ordnance Survey in these islands comparisons between the field operations, let's say, in Scotland and those in Ireland and what we might be able to learn from those and, uh, in effect, celebrate that work of 200 years ago. But recognising as well, of course, that this survey heritage uh, is under threat. Um, it's at risk. Uh, much of it is, is in fairly hostile environments on summits it's above 3,000 feet or 1,000 metres. Um, so uh, a lot of it actually is uh, really awaiting discovery and recording. And that's how I'm going to close the talk uh, with a few pointers to the workshops that um, Susan mentioned at the start that we would be running in the early new year. So by way of introduction and background, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking, giving you a history of the Ordnance Survey. That's not my task here at all. There's a huge amount of literature uh, by historians, very eminent historians, including Charles Close himself, once Director General of the Ordnance Survey on the early years of the Ordnance Survey, and a, a celebratory commemorative volume um, published in 1991, um, their Ordnance Survey Mapmakers to Britain since 1791, produced by the Ordnance Survey. And these are, are really rich resources themselves about um, the, the Ordnance Survey as a national agency. Uh, and what I'd like to just suggest here is that often these, these histories are written very much from the point of view of sort of like a national history of seeing the Ordnance Survey as a national mapping organisation and reflecting the nation's, in a singular, the nation's history. But in a devolved UK setting, I just wonder where we might begin to maybe peel apart some of those layers a little bit more and to think about the differences between the nations and our relationships with the National Mapping Agency of the Ordnance Survey. The differences, let's say, between Ireland, Scotland, Wales and England. And there has been, of course, quite a, a, a strong dimension to the history of Ordnance Survey, linking it to issues around national identity. Um, some of that quite serious literature, like Rachel Hewitt's really excellent book called Map of a Nation, a biography of the Ordnance Survey, and very much rooting the development of the early Ordnance in uh, nation building uh, in, the 70, in the 18th, 19th, and in the 20th centuries as well. And Mike Parker's wonderful and very uh, illuminating, quite amusing uh, book uh, called Map Addict. I really do recommend that. It's a fantastic read. Um, and his love of Ordnance Survey maps. So here's, a, here's somebody who's a map addict, somebody who really loves his Ordnance Survey maps. Uh, but again, for very much relating that to uh, his uh, feelings around identity and nation building. He lives in Wales and he's English himself. So there's a kind of very strong connection between uh, national identity and uh, the Ordnance Survey. And it's the same truth as well, which is, where I'm based now, at least in Northern Ireland, uh, and a strong literature as well. John Andrews, who unfortunately died just uh, last year, actually uh, wrote to Paper Landscape, a really monumental volume telling us in a quite a lot of detail, actually, about the Ordnance Survey and its operations in Ireland in the 19th century. Uh, and a celebratory volume, again, published in the 1990s by the Ordnance Survey in Ireland and uh, Northern Ireland. We have two Ordnance Surveys here. Uh, and more recently, um, cultural historians uh, thinking critically about the Ordnance Survey in Ireland, hence the titles here, the Civilizing, Civilizing Ireland, 
Um, and the close connection, some of you may know Brian Friel's play, Translations, which is an exploration of the impact and the cultural legacy of the, of the British Ordnance Survey and the British Ordnance Surveyors in Gaelic speaking islands in the northwest of Ireland in the early part of the 19th century and the kind of cultural collision that that, uh, that, that uh, instilled. So there was quite a strong and, uh, and uh, an interesting um, relationship to be explored between the Ordnance Survey and our nation's histories and national identities. So uh, I think it's worth bearing that in mind as we begin to drill down into some of the figures, some of those who were responsible uh, for shaping the Ordnance Survey, but also shaping its field practices in the landscape, which is what we'll be looking at in a, in a, in a short while. Um, Close, I've mentioned already, already in his early years of the Ordnance Survey, and what's really important about Close's book is that it was in effect a kind of an attempt uh, in the early part of the 20th century to record the, the work of the early Ordnance Survey, hence the title of the volume on first-hand accounts. And that's really important because much of the uh, record of and the archive of the early Ordnance Survey in Britain, not in Ireland, in Britain was lost uh, in, uh, when uh, Southampton was bombed in the Second World War. Uh, and that destroyed quite a considerable amount of the archive. Now that itself poses a bit of a challenge to us because if we want to really understand the early Ordnance Survey, Yes, we have volumes like uh, Charles Close's uh, Early Years of the Ordnance Survey. But if we've lost an archive, where might we go to explore the Early Ordnance Survey in the landscape? Well, of course, we might go to the landscape, to the places there where the Ordnance Survey surveyors themselves were operating, and to use archaeology and archaeological evidence to help us understand something of that, uh, those early years of the Ordnance Survey. There are historical accounts. Um, William Mudge uh, really was absolutely fundamental in getting the Ordnance Survey up and running in the late part of the 18th century, and early 19th century, uh, and wrote these huge volumes, actually, very detailed volumes about the trigonometrical survey, which is a very important part of the early Ordnance Survey operations. Uh, the trigonometrical survey pretty much underpinned the Ordnance Survey maps which we, uh, which we know and love today. And then also uh, his successor, Thomas Colby, who is a really important figure for us, a director of the Ordnance Survey there in the early years of the 19th century, 1820 to 1846, as it says there. And the reason that's in, that those dates are important for us, or at least important for me, and the reason Colby is important for us and, and for me, is because he provides a link between the Ordnance Survey operations in Scotland and the Ordnance Survey operations in Ireland in the 1820s. So let's think about that just for a moment, the 1820s, where we are in 2020. So 200 years ago, if we think about what, uh, what um, uh, Colby was doing uh, in both Ireland and Scotland, it gives us a basis, at least I think, for drawing some comparisons between the field operations of the Ordnance Survey between Scotland and uh, Ireland. And you've only got to look at that little quotation there uh, from the close volume, whilst the trigonometrical work in the southwest of Scotland has been in progress, and uh, various hills in Ireland have been marked with signals and linked up by intersection to the Scottish hills. So very close connection being forged through the trigonometrical survey under Thomas Colby in the 1820s between Scotland and uh, Ireland. Another key figure for us is Portlock, who, who's, uh, who wrote a biography of Colby, a memoir, as it says there. And I think also um, Portlock, because Portlock was in the field with Colby doing these surveys in Scotland and in Ireland, we have again, despite the loss of the archive of the Ordnance Survey in the Second World War, we have some glimpses through these uh, accounts of what, was, what life was like uh, in the field uh, with the Ordnance Survey surveyors in the 1820s. Um, so there we have a little quotation there about Colby uh, out uh, in the Western Isles um, surveying, including uh, uh, then traveling over to uh, Ireland to look at Divis, which you'll see in a minute, uh, near Belfast, and Steve Donard uh, in County Down. So the first hand accounts are useful uh, to draw some of these parallels and these connections and comparisons between 
um, Scotland and Ireland and the field operations of the Ordnance Survey in the 1820s. Um, and we can see that in this figure here, which is uh, a diagram from a fairly lengthy uh, set of volumes, actually, about the Ordnance Survey's trigonometrical survey. Uh, this is the survey using triangulation methods and trigonometry using angles and angle measurements, in other words, to calculate distances between fixed points. And that's what we're looking at, this sort of spider's web uh, image here of the mountain tops and the trigonometrical stations picked out with dates. Uh, and then those lines connecting those trigonometrical stations are representing the rays they're called. Those are the, the sightings between the fixed points which were undertaken by a theodolite. So we're getting now to think a little bit about those uh, field operations. And this image represents um, the culmination of that work in the field and also highlights the close interconnection between the trigonometrical survey uh, in Scotland and the trigonometrical survey in Ireland. And you've already got to look at the way those rays or those lines cross the North Channel between Ireland and Scotland, and also the Isle of Man in England and Wales as well. So this is what I'm interested in then, is looking behind the map, looking behind those lines, and begin to think a little bit about an archeology span of the Ordnance Survey. So the next part of my talk is really to say a little bit about how we might begin to define what we might mean by an archeology span of the Ordnance Survey, and what we might in fact gain from it. And I'm going to do that by um, looking first of all at some of the instruments, I've mentioned the theodolite already, and also some of the infrastructures associated with the field, what, field operations of the early Ordnance Survey in these islands. Um, when we think about, sometimes when I talk about the archaeology of the Ordnance Survey, um, the response I get is, oh, well, yes, of course, Ordnance Survey maps are really good at showing archaeology. And yes, they are. And uh, I'm sure I'm not alone in picking up an Ordnance Survey map and uh, studying it intently uh, for archaeological monuments, sites and monuments in the landscape, uh, whether they're long barrows or dolmens, uh, they saw me sat on one early on in Wiltshire, you know, using our Ordnance Survey maps because they are such a good record of archaeological sites and monuments. But that's not really what I'm talking about here when I talk about uh, an archaeology of the Ordnance Survey. You know, it's an archaeology of the Ordnance Survey that I'm interested in. There is an archaeology, there is of course archaeology on Ordnance Survey maps, and that has a long history, going right the way back into, into the latter part of the 18th century and William Roy. Um, and also subsequent to him in the 20th century, uh, the really important and influential work of OGS Crawford. So, you know, the archaeology in the landscape, yes, it's visible on Ordnance Survey maps and has long been so. And there's a very important relationship between archaeology and the Ordnance Survey. But it's not really the point of what I'm interested in here. I'm not saying it's not important, it is, but my focus is rather different. My focus is on an archaeology of the Ordnance Survey, which has, I would argue, been rather neglected by archaeologists. Um, so even though we have a, a, a tradition of landscape archaeology very much rooted, actually, as you'll see from that volume by Mick Aston, Trevor Rowley there, called Landscape Archaeology, a very long tradition of using maps and map making as part of the toolkit for uh, landscape archaeology. As you can see in the little quotation there from that volume of how far, how uh, by far the most important document to the fieldwork is the map. Um, both, both as something to study and as also a tool, a way of visualizing landscape archaeology. So that's another kind of dimension to think about this relationship between landscape and archaeology. But um, it's slightly different again to what I'm thinking about when I talk about an archaeology of the Ordnance Survey. So let me try and explain that a little bit more. Um, so when we look at our Ordnance Survey maps, they are the product of field operations. They are the culmination of the very busy and arduous work of surveying in the field. And sometimes perhaps when we look at our finished Ordnance Survey maps like the six inch county series maps of Ireland, they're so clean, they're so beautiful, they're so inviting uh, and so fascinating. And, and in a way they kind of hide some of that arduousness, the task, of the field survey officer uh, in the field, 
with those instruments, um, trying to survey the ground. And they kind of almost allied that uh, busyness and that uh, perhaps messiness of the field operations. So what I'm trying to do in an archaeology of cartography is look behind that nice finished map to the landscape and the field operations of the surveyors themselves. Men like these men here, this is a fairly well used image of the Ordnance Survey the Sappers and Miners in Ireland in the 1820s. And I love to use it. I think it's so evocative, thinking about Brian Friel's play I mentioned earlier, and how, what kind of impact these British soldiers would have had in the island of Ireland and the Gaelic speaking parts of Ireland like County Donegal in the 1820s with, with their red uniforms, all their instruments, their camps, their theodolites. You'll see two men standing at behind at the top left of this image, setting up a theodolite. And on the right hand side, a beacon set upon the hill for which they are taking their sight lines. And then down in the valley bottom here, we have the tents, the camp belonging to the surveyors themselves. It's a very evocative image, and it makes us think a lot, I think, about the field operations themselves. It kind of makes us think about the impacts that these men would have had, not only on the people uh, living at that time, but on the landscapes within which they are operating, within which they are surveying. And that's what I really want to focus on here, looking at the instruments that these men used uh, at the time as material culture in the landscape, but also thinking about the infrastructure that had to be created in order to, uh, to conduct uh, the Ordnance Survey field operations. We are fortunate that there is some archival material relating to this in print form, in published form, which we can draw upon. Um, some of it is rather technical, let's say, uh, at least, um, but nevertheless, it's quite useful. And there are uh, accounts, written accounts, these are from Ireland again, uh, from the field notebooks, for example, which were used by the surveyors. So we do have a, an archive, uh, a documentary record. Um, but what I'm interested in here then are the instruments, the material cultures of the Ordnance Survey and the particular instruments being used in the field as part of those field operations. And a good example of that, I think here uh, from Ireland is the, um, they're called Colby's Bars. So the bottom right hand, uh, part of this first slide here, you'll see an image uh, of one of these so-called Colby's bars, which were uh, a fixed length uh, created by Thomas Colby, invented by Thomas Colby, in order to very accurately measure a baseline. And the baseline was a really important part of field operations, the trigonometrical survey um, uh, using theodolites. The baseline was a ground-based linear measurement between two fixed points. And from that very accurately laid out baseline, it was possible then to calculate through trigonometry um, the positions of the trigonometrical stations, which were surveyed using a theodolite, using indirect measurements. So this is a form, the baseline was a form of direct measurement on the ground. So you can see the tents there, uh, shielding, this is Loch Foyle in the northern part of Northern Ireland, uh, near, near Derry, London Derry in Loch Foyle, overlooking actually uh, the Inner Sherman Peninsula and Sleeve Snacked I showed earlier. And the tents there shielding and sheltering not just the men, but also these very delicate instruments which they're setting up on those little um, uh, trestles there that you can see. You see the tripods and the trestles, the tents. There's a whole paraphernalia of instrumentation which is fundamental to the survey operations which we see here. And Colby's bars were used not just in Ireland, but also by uh, Everest, George Everest in the survey of India uh, taking place for the Great Trigonometrical Survey at around the same time. And if you visit Dublin and you go to Phoenix Park and you visit the headquarters of Ordnance Survey Ireland, there's a little museum. And in that little museum, you will see that image on the bottom right hand side, you will see uh, the remains of Colby's bars, they're there preserved. These are really important parts of our archeological record of the Ordnance Survey. We also have, uh, amazingly enough really, a surviving theodolite um, used by the Ordnance Survey, um, pictured there left from the Science Museum, but on the right-hand side from a contemporary um, printed 
uh, publication about the Ordnance Survey, Ramsden's Great Theodolite. A three foot theodolite, these were three foot in diameter. Just think about that for a moment. The size, the bulk of these things, the weight of these things, the fragility of these things, but the necessity of having to carry and transport these uh, very fragile instruments, essential instruments to the trigonometrical survey across difficult terrain in the 1820s before, let's remember, before the railway age really took off. I mean, the 1825, the Stockton and Darlington Railway, you know, and what was that? Just a few miles. So this was a massive undertaking. And I think looking at these instruments and thinking about how they were used by the surveyors at the time really brings home to us the significance of those field operations of the Ordnance Survey. The material culture speaks to us in a way perhaps that some of the documentary sources do not. Um, and I've got here just uh, an illustration, a map from that earlier diagram I showed you with the trigonometrical stations in the northern part of Ireland. And the different colours represent the trigonometrical stations where that great theodolite, the thing we've just been looking at, had to be lugged, carried, manhandled from summit to summit across bogs, you know, on carts, perhaps also sometimes by sea or by inland navigation. Um, to those summits, to the stations on, on hilltops at Divis, Sleeve Donard, Saul, Knocklade, uh, and, the, and the Lockfoyle baseline itself. So, you know, this is what I think some of these instruments remind us of, of that arduousness. So this is Divis, the summit of Divis, and a little bit of a description from the time about the location of that station. This is one of the earliest trigonometrical stations on the island of Ireland in 1825. It was one of the stations that was viewed by Colby from Scotland in the early 1820s. It overlooked Belfast. Um, and we're looking here now at the remains of this little marker on the ground showing the site of that trigonometrical station described uh, in, uh, in the 1850s here, but the station itself in the 1820s, marked by a large pile of core stones. Well, unfortunately, um, Divis being a very important point for watching and surveilling um, Belfast during the Troubles meant that the MOD, the military, the British military, removed most of the archaeology of that site itself. But nevertheless, now the National Trust own uh, Divis and it's possible to visit the site and to think about the arduousness of looking at that massive instrument uh, across the landscape. And some quotations from Portlock and from others as well um, about this arduousness of what those instruments and what these accounts remind us of with the difficulties of undertaking uh, this survey work. Um, I'm just going to see if there's a, one of those quotations you might just read out. The, the bottom one there is um, relating to Saul, uh, a mountain in the wild district of count, the county of Derry, um, which uh, is in the Sperrin Mountains, a beautiful part of of Northern Ireland, the north of Ireland, um, about Colby leaving the mountain in November. You know, think about the time of year uh, that these field operations were taking place in, uh, the role of Colby himself, but also um, Portlock and others with him. And the observatories they're talking about here are the, are the observation platforms or stations where they had to manhandle that three foot theodolite in a position in order to take their readings and their recordings, their sightings along those long distances as, as represented by those rays on that map you saw earlier. So the material culture and think about instruments in the field, I think is uh, instructive for us, but it wasn't just instruments which were a reflection of that arduousness, that task of working in the landscape. There were also infrastructures necessary uh, for the field operations of the Ordnance Survey. This was a massive undertaking in the 1820s, not just in Ireland, but also in Britain as well. Uh, as you'd expect, highly well organized by the British military. Um, and the trigonometrical field operations were really only one part of the map making process. There were other kinds of survey operations necessary, including topographical survey. I suppose I'm interested more in the trigonometrical survey because it's more obviously leaving an imprint in the landscape itself, which we'll see now when we think about some of these infrastructures. So I've mentioned already the Lockfoyle baseline, 
um, and the and the uh, Colby's bars, which you can see in this nice coloured illustration from the time, and those same tents we were looking at just a moment ago. This is from a, a publication from 1847 by the Ordnance Survey. The Lock Four baseline itself um, is, in a sense, commemorated by the Ordnance Survey through the construction of uh, these so-called base towers. Um, these are round uh, monuments. They are now actually scheduled, uh, they're ancient monuments uh, themselves, but were created in the 1820s by the Ordnance Survey to mark the points along the Loch Foyle baseline. Uh, and it's interesting, this is a contemporary account of the creation of these um, base towers, as they're called. Um, and what I'm struck by here is this uh, quotation, I've underlined it, of how, how the masonry is covered over with a tumulus of earth. These are massive monuments. They were designed to last. They weren't simply created for the field operations themselves. They were in effect monuments or memorials constructed to the work of the surveyors themselves. And the tumulus of earth, I think it almost resonates um, in my mind with that idea of commemoration or creating a monument to themselves, creating something which would be seen to be uh, a long lasting feature in the landscape. Um, so there is an infrastructure which is really important in the work of the Ordnance Survey in the 1820s. Uh, through the baseline, like the Loch Ford baseline, we see it in these towers. Um, here's another tower. This is the North End uh, Tower, um, which is uh, a little bit away from what we've just been looking at, but in a more rural setting, um, sitting out in a, in a field and surrounded by railings, pretty much as it was in the 1820s. And very hard, if we were to actually dig down into one of those uh, tumuli there, uh, behind the railings, what we would find is in effect a kind of sarcophagus. Um, this is the chamber that's talked about there, the chamber of masonry, six feet square, covered with a lid of flagstone. Uh, and this would be a, the point, one of the points at which uh, the, those, those trestles would have been set up for the very accurate measurement of that baseline in the 18, uh, end of the 1820s. Back to sleeve snacked, and it kind of this infrastructure is not just about baselines. The infrastructure is also important in relation to those trigonometrical stations on the summits themselves. So this is sleeve snacked, and I've ringed here those features just in case perhaps we didn't see them earlier clearly enough. Those features in the landscape which are evident on this aerial image, and I put there a little quotation again from a description, a contemporary description from the 1820s of that station, that trigonometrical station on sleeve snacked. And what we're probably looking at there when we see those, uh, those features in the landscape are the activities of the surveyors themselves uh, and the legacies they've left behind in the landscape through their field operations. So here's a little quotation um, from Drummond writing to Colby about uh, being on sleeve snacked in October, again, difficult time of year, 1825. The tent is now up and in a few minutes, the war round it will be completed so that we may consider ourselves safe against any storm. So that begins to make us perhaps think a little bit about what those structures on the summit of sleeve stack might have been made for, for creating some shelter for the tents of the surveyors themselves. And they go on to say, of the termination of our labours, the letters from Divis, which we've already been to the summit of Divis, do you remember, will already have apprised you at the last, we had nothing remaining but the lamp tent and the walls of the cooking house. I believe that we should have been compelled to abandon the hill, but for the efforts of the men, the arduousness again comes through. So we have a, we have a lamp tent and we have the walls of a cooking house. These are significant structures. It's not simply just about tents, ephemeral things, ephemeral camp structures. The Ordnance Survey are leaving a mark, an imprint, a legacy in the landscape. And that's what I think we're looking at when we see this aerial image of the, of the summit of Sleeve Snack. Well, you'll be saying perhaps, well, we've heard of Colby's camps. And indeed, if we look uh, to Scotland, we will indeed find examples of, um, uh, of uh, these same sorts of structures. Um, and again, I think this invites some interesting comparative, uh, some comparative analysis between the activities of the Ordnance Survey in Scotland and Ireland. 
and these landscape legacies we see. So here we have a contemporary image, camp of the party employed on, on the ordnance survey uh, on Creft Vane uh, in Argyllshire. So this comes from Canmore, and we'll see a little bit more about this in a minute. But you notice there some interesting structures. Let me just point them out. On the summit of the hill here, we have what appears to be uh, so perhaps the observation tower, the cairn, on which the theodolite was situated. A little lower down the slopes here, we have this rectangular structure here, which is not too dissimilar, if we think about it, to some of these rectangular structures on the uh, aerial image of Sleeve Snat. And these are the tents here, and the tents themselves, uh, and their kind of shape, you can imagine nestling perhaps in some of these uh, um, uh, elliptical enclosures with walls around them. And if we look actually at uh, Creft Vane and some of the uh, brilliant, amazing um, imagery that we have, I've unfortunately never been to the summit myself, but there's a very good article in uh, the Charles Close Society's uh, journal called Sheet Lines, which is online actually, uh, a, a brilliant little article on Colby's camps, these things are called. And you can see there some of these in the center of the image there, some of these, um, again, elliptical structures, very, very similar to what we saw on Sleeve Snacked, um, as well as the massive stonewall windbreaks. This is infrastructure created by the Ordnance Survey in order to facilitate the work of the Ordnance Survey in the field here on the summit of Creft Vane. So this, this, some of these sites are known, some of these sites are recorded, some of them are scheduled, but by no means all. And I think this is a challenge for us to think about going out into the field when the time is right for us to do that and using these online resources and to begin to construct an archeology span of the Auden survey. It's not just about trigonometrical stations, of course. Um, we might also want to think a little bit about other kinds of field operations of the Auden survey. And that might include looking at the work of those leveling. That is to, that is to say, um, taking heights and elevations, not just the trigonometrical survey looking at angles um, through, through the theodolite, but actually working in the field and these lines that we see on the summit of sleeve snack on the Ordnance Survey six inch map represent uh, those, um, those traces uh, in the landscape where the, the chain men with, with the chains, as it says there in the quotation from Portlock, were out with the staff leveling the land, you know, working out the different heights, the elevations, the spot heights, which you can see uh, the figures on the, on the image there. From trig point to trig point, the chain was dragged, said Charles Close. This is arduous work. So again, you know, we can look behind the map. The map itself is the finished product. It tells us about the leveling process of when a map and the benchmarks a map shows. You can see on this map here, this is another Irish example, BM benchmark, a little crow's foot. And in the uh, information below there about the leveling itself. And the leveling itself began in the 1840s in Ireland. It's slightly earlier actually in parts of um, Britain. And those very familiar perhaps to many of us, those benchmarks, those cr the crow's foot, as it's sometimes called, which we see, this is a little example, not far from where I live. Uh, this is a Donachadi, uh, just a few miles from where I am now in Bangor, uh, in the northeast of Ireland. So leveling is another really important uh, aspect of the field operations of the Ordnance Survey, requiring instrumentation and requiring infrastructure. There's a record of the operations of the Ordnance Survey levelers, um, we, the list of benchmarks typical of the Ordnance Survey at the time, really rich and very detailed uh, accounts. If you look at the, uh, the descriptions here of where these benchmarks are situated, uh, the distances between the benchmarks, uh, the actual locations of the benchmarks, and here they are still in the landscape. You know, if we go out and look for ourselves, we can see this infrastructure these legacies, these landscape legacies of the Ordnance Survey are still with us and are awaiting discovery. So I'm going to begin to draw things to a close now in the next and um, the final sort of few minutes of what I want to talk about. Um, having looked a little bit about uh, uh, on how we might define an archaeology of the Ordnance Survey, instruments and infrastructures, 
I want to say a little bit about well, where we might go with some of this material and think about how uh, we might ourselves explore some of these landscape legacies of the field operations of the early Jordan survey uh, in these islands. And there are two ways we can begin to do that, really. And this relates to the practices of landscape archaeology, I think, and also my own discipline of historical geography, where we tend to start with a desktop study in the dry and the warm of our office or our study of working with maps, with aerial photographs, which now are by and large online and um, very useful for us, before then turning to the field itself and entering the field, um, having been at least informed by the desktop study to maybe test out some of what we're seeing from the desktop study in the field. Sometimes it's called ground truthing um, from the desktop study. So I want to say a little bit about both of those um, and just to begin to invite us to follow in the footsteps of those ordnance survey surveyors. So if you can bear with me for about another 10 minutes uh, and then it's time for a cup of tea or maybe something stronger. So let's follow in the footsteps of these ordnance surveyors and the legacies in the landscape. And we can begin to do that through our desktop study through using those online resources. And especially uh, we are indebted, I reckon, to the National Library of Scotland and especially, let me say, Chris Fleet and his colleagues who've done absolutely amazing work in bringing to a very wide audience ordnance survey maps of Great Britain. And, and not just making Northern Survey maps digitally available, but because these maps now have been geo-rectified and geo-referenced in a geographic information system, it's possible to overlay those historic Ordnance Survey maps onto aerial imagery. And that's a really powerful thing to be able to do. And that's what we're looking at here. This is actually the Cheviots. So I'm afraid we're just over the border here, folks, uh, just south of the border, dare I take us just south of the border, uh, to the Cheviots, beautiful part of the northeast of England. But look here at this Ordnance Survey map. We can see a trigonometrical station, the triangular feature here with the dots so familiar to us, the benchmark with the crow's foot. But the aerial image also shows this image, this, sorry, also shows this feature here. It's marked on the map as Cairn. What is this feature here? It looks again familiar to us, doesn't it now, when we think about Sleeve Snacked or we think about Cref Bain. You know, it looks familiar to us. And we can use some of the documentary sources from the early Ordnance Survey and the locations of those trigonometrical stations and the latitudes and longitudes given and begin to draw the two things together, the archeological record through the desktop study and also the archive through the documentary sources. And that's really all we're doing here when we begin to look at some of these uh, online resources um, like the National Library uh, of Scotland's um, amazing resource here. So I'm going to give you a few examples of that. I'm just going to give you a few live demos, but because time is against us, as always, I have too much to say. Um, I think some of these demos can hold over until we meet for our workshops. I'm hoping some of these uh, slides might entice you to join us for our workshops in the new year. So I'm not going to get too distracted with clicking the links, um, but nevertheless, the, this whole PowerPoint will, will be available to you to download from the Arch website uh, in due course, so you can explore for yourselves. But here we are at Clisham. Um, so again, using the National Library of Scotland uh, a web mapping resource and uh, looking at the Ordnance Survey map here uh, and the trigonometrical station on, on Clisham. And an account from uh, the eight, from the 1840s, from when uh, Clisham was uh, surveyed. And again, an interesting account in itself, the huts are mentioned, a pile or cairn, 18 feet high, imagine that. These are not small features in the landscape, are they? They're pretty significant. For the reception of the frame of the instrument, you might remember the theodolite I showed you earlier, Ramsden's theodolite, the three foot theodolite, stood on a sort of frame, a wooden frame. Um, so the, the, what we're looking at here, what this description is telling us is how this theodolite was located um, and how important the centre mark, you know, is if you revisit a trigonometrical station, it's so important that you recite your theodolite in exactly the same place as it was before. And that's what's being described here in this account. And this comes from uh, a, a, a volume which uh, you can access through the National Library of Scotland and a trigonometrical diagram, which is a really useful guide to it for us to locate those early trigonometrical stations like Clisham. Um, 
Now, one of the brilliant tools as part of the National Library of Scotland um, uh, map, uh, web mapping uh, platform is this ability to, to compare the map side by side with an aerial photograph. So here's Cleesham uh, on an Ordnance Survey, uh, six inch map on the left hand side, oh sorry, one inch map it actually sells us there, um, and also an aerial image, a uh, Bing aerial image on the right hand side. And let's just zoom in a little bit and we can begin to see again some interesting features as we zoom in, and as you zoom in through the map, the aerial image also zooms in. So you can begin to compare map and image, image and map, okay? And those circled features there are surely, now we've seen them, uh, interesting, are they not, in what they might represent as uh, the legacies of the Ordnance Survey on the summit here of Cleesham. This is somebody else's photograph, but it begins to, again, invite us to think, well, the map, the aerial photograph points to some legacies in the landscape. What about the field itself? Now, we may not want or we may not be able to climb the summit of Cleesham, of course, but thanks to the work of others, we can virtually climb these summits and we can use these resources. And one of the brilliant, again, for Scotland, resources available to us is Canmore. And Cleesham itself is uh, on the Canmore database um, it has this map interface, it's a brilliant thing, it's really easy to use. Uh, and if we just click on that dot there, the little pop-up box tells us, well, what do you know? What we're looking at is a Colby camp from the 19th century. And we can drill down into a little bit more detail to the description of this uh, Colby camp. Um, so so uh, it's, as, it say, as it says there, this is on Clisham. So we have on Camel or in Camel in the database, some evidence that tells us something about the uh, early Colby camps in Scotland. But that database actually only for the Colby camps records um, a smallish number. When we compare the number of trigonometrical stations on this diagram here, which comes from the work of David Walker, again from this journal Sheet Lines of the Charles Close Society. Look at all those dots, look at all those ray lines, Look at all those names, all those summit stations of the Ordnance Survey from the 1820s. Wonder, I wonder, I wonder, you know, what, what's left of those stations on those summits? How can we begin to add to the Canmore data set, to the Canmore database? This is Corey Habby Hill uh, in Murray, um, again, using the, this time using the National Library of Scotland side-by-side uh, -side map at the top and the aerial image. And looking at the Canmore entry, well, there's no mention of a Colby camp here, according to Canmore. Instead, we have an a structure with a period unassigned on the summit. But if we go to an account of uh, Corrie Habby Hill, and this is from Charles Close's uh, uh, book on the, early, on the early history of the Ordnance Survey, so I have not time to read the whole quotation, but I've outlined in red, this is Colby and his men climbing to the summit of Corrie Habby Hill. Um, and, and again, talking about um, selecting a place, a suitable place for a turf hovel, a place for a watch tent, a selected spot for an encampment when some of the tents have been brought up. Uh, one of them, one or two of them pitched for present use. A party of the men were withdrawn from this duty and employed in pulling down the cairn, the pile of stones built around the station staff and in setting up in its place, the observatory tent. It sounds very familiar, does it not, to what we've been looking at in these other places, but it's not, as I've mentioned in Canmore, recorded as a Colby camp. So maybe here is an example, our desktop study has re revealed the possibility of a site which is worthy of further investigation. So this might lead us to the field. And this is the sort of thing I've been doing myself. This is from Wales, from Cadiadris, a summit, uh, not quite 3,000 feet, but an early trigonometrical station of the Ordnance Survey in Wales this time, of course. Um, and actually going out into the landscape. Now, the, the very familiar um, trig pillar, which I'm sure many of us who've been in the hills will be using uh, probably to rest our mug of tea on quite often, or to have a photograph taken to say, we've summited, we've reached the summit. Those trig, those trig pillars, uh, which are marked on the Ordnance Survey maps as well, belong really to the 1940s and the 1950s and the re-triangulation uh, of Great Britain and, and Ireland as well. But the trig pillar there is actually sited on a pile of stones. That pile of stones are the remains 
of those earlier trigonometrical stations. And the pile of stones, it looked very rubbly, but the features you're looking at in this image, uh, which I took on the summit of Cadiadris, represent again, those structures, those landscape legacies in the field. You can begin to see here, perhaps the fireplace, in fact, inside um, this structure here uh, with, the, with the stone lintel. It, lo it looked a little bit like a holy well, actually, when you first stumble across this, this is the main path of Cadiadris, where the water is here. It looks a little bit like a holy well, but inside it's not a holy well, it's a fireplace. And inside the fireplace is a metal grate, a cast iron grate. You know, again, you know, this is serious infrastructure. This is stuff that had to be built, like those men on Corriehabi Hill that Colby talks about, building these things. And they're still there with us in the landscape. Sometimes not always as obvious, this is an example from Northern Ireland. Uh, my former colleague, Mark Gardner, now at the University of Lincoln, is an archeologist, did a lot of field work in County Antrim. And you remember the quotation perhaps about the linkage between Ireland and Scotland through the trigonometrical survey of Colby in the 1820s and the marking out of hills with signals. Well, these small cairns, like the one that Mark found here uh, in Little Trosk uh, near Carnloch uh, and County Antrim, overlooking there towards the North Channel, you can see Scotland in the distance. These are again, probably the sites and monuments of the early Ordnance Survey. Uh, and it's sometimes very subtle features, the bolts used by the levelers, by those men with the chains, uh, putting bolts down in boulders uh, from the trig point to the trig point where the chain was dragged, according to Charles Close. In the background is Divis the summit station where you saw me earlier on and saw the chap looking down at the, uh, the form of um, trigonometrical station there. So in the final, just to sum up then, in the final couple of minutes, um, I tested your patience long enough. In the final couple of minutes then, where might this lead us? The desktop study leading to the field survey. What then? Why might we be interested in doing this work? Well, I want to just try and hopefully convince you to join us in this project and to, and to actually contribute to what I think is a really important part of our nations in the plural history and histories of the Ordnance Survey in Scotland and in Ireland and the bicentenary, which is upcoming. Do you remember those dates? 1820s, 1822, 1824, they're not long away. So what we can begin to do perhaps is go out ourselves into the landscape and to open up that landscape and the legacies of the Ordnance Survey, which we find within it, whether they're benchmarks, whether they're Colby camps, whatever they might be, and to bring these to a wider public audience, because we think, I think they're important. They're part of our survey heritage. They're something which we should be celebrating and recognizing. There are those enthusiasts, and I probably count myself as one of those, who are already doing this sort of work, uh, just in their spare time, uh, interested, you know, and why not in getting out there and doing uh, trig bagging, it's called, when you go around and you try and get every single trig pillar, a bit like Monroe bagging, but for trig pillars, or benchmarking and databases that we can contribute to if we wish, uh, like benchmarks.org.uk. Um, so there are enthusiasts busy doing this, um, but I think it would be also worth us to organize ourselves in a way before some of this survey heritage is lost forever. And it's already actually under threat. So this is an example from County Cork of a trigonometrical station, the triangle circled, the sand pit now has encroached and destroyed that trigonometrical station, gone forever. And the uh, Lockfoil baseline, although some of the monuments, the base towers are scheduled, we have lost one of them. Mount Sandy base tower, right on the uh, shoreline there, as you can see from this aerial image with the six inch Jordan survey map superimposed. This is my colleague, Connor Graham, doing this work here at Queens. You can see how that base tower is on the beach and it has in fact been lost to coastal erosion. So there is a, a need to, I think, to undertake these desktop studies and site surveys to begin to get our, ourselves organized to identify and characterize the Ordnance Survey structures and features in the landscape, record, evaluate these, contribute to databases, especially databases like Canmore, uh, but others as well, to help us to begin to 
evaluate the significance of the Ordnance Survey in the field, to look behind the map. We value the Ordnance Survey maps, do we not? But we should also, I would argue, value the legacies in the landscape uh, left behind by those who created those maps. That's neglected heritage and deserves more recognition. And I think now with the bicentenary, we have the opportunity to do that, to mark our nation's contributions. And this is significant in the wider uh, development of the history of science and geography. You know, this is important, it's of international and global significance. The Ordnance Survey was leading uh, globally in the 1820s in the practices of uh, survey uh, and cartography. Uh, and so we have an opportunity, I think, through surveying the surveyors ourselves, through mapping monuments, um, to recognize these sites and draw people's attention. And also, most of all, to enjoy the landscapes and to enjoy the maps, the things that really drive us and uh, have got us through uh, these very strange times we are in at the moment. So if you're interested, you can please join us for our Mapping Monuments workshops in 2021. And Susan, I'm sure, will be able to say more about that. And I think they'll be advertised in the ARCH newsletter in due course. Um, but there'll be information on the website. The date's January 25th, uh, 2021, February 22nd, 2021 evening. Uh, they're not lectures, they're workshops. So we'll be doing stuff. And I'll be giving you demos and we'll be working through some examples and we'll be having discussions. So I'll be very interested to hear uh, your thoughts and uh, to receive your questions. And I really thank you for your interest and for your patience. Thanks very much, Keith. That's um, lots to think about. Fascinating what still remains of a lot of these camps. Um, and also really interesting to see that we can do a lot of this working on our own now and doing a lot before we actually get out in the field. Um, so I'll just I'll open it for questions. Let me see if I can pull up the chat again. So we've got some, um, a couple of um, questions are coming in. <clears throat> and one of the things I was struck with was your, these Colby bars, these fascinating Colby bars and the towers that went over them. So we've had a query, query from me on this is that, I mean, how far, how big were these bars? How did they actually move them and keep them level? So that they could move them through the landscape and not distort. And the towers that went over places, a question came in from Fiona saying, are these still only found in Ireland or will we find some of these in Scotland as well? Thanks for the uh, questions. Um, the bars themselves are sort of, you know, so big, uh, <laughs> about five feet long, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so you're testing my knowledge there, um, having seen the things. So, um, but they, they, what they did is they put them uh, and, uh, on those trestles that we saw in that uh, illustration, they put them on the trestles and they, they were moved along bit by inch along, literally inched along across the landscape, along a fixed line. Um, and they used micrometers and all sorts of things to try and make sure that the, the things were really accurately um, set out. And that's why they had the tents is to keep the sun off the bars, to try and keep the temperature constant and the humidity and all those sorts of things. So that, that's really what they're trying to do there. The, those base towers mark the terminal points of the baseline and one or two also one or two sort of intervening points as well, actually. But they're mainly there to mark the terminal points. And if they were excavated, then what would, one would find was one of these slabs with a little mark and that would, lit, that would mark the end of the baseline. So it would be possible to recreate, again, this is the idea, it'd be possible to recreate um, the baseline measurements. Um, and in the 1960s, that was done by the Ordnance Survey in Northern Ireland with what in the 1960s was modern technology. And they again found uh, the, the original measurements to be very accurate. Mm -hmm. um, these, these base towers, interestingly, um, I don't think, I've looked actually for examples within Britain for these things. Now there were certainly baselines uh, in Britain. I mean, the Ordnance Survey used baselines, the Hounslow um, near where Heathrow Airport is, um, early on, Mudge used uh, upright cannon, actually, to mark the terminal points of, of the baseline. And they're still there, actually. Uh, and the same for Salisbury Plain. There was also a baseline at Salisbury Plain, and there was an upended cannon. Uh, and it's still there. It's at Old Serum. If anybody knows Old Serum, which is near Salisbury. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Sue's waving, yeah. 
<laughs> um, then you'll, you'll um, you know, you maybe know this. There's, there's a, actually a little stone that also says this is the terminal point of, of, the, of the baseline, but not the towers. And I think this is the thing that I find really interesting that something changes. So remember those, those cannon really belong to the, uh, to Mudge's day, to the early, to the 1810s, 1800s, 1810s. And then I think something changes in the 1820s and under Colby. And he wants to memorialize, well, this is how I see. I think the Ordnance Survey begin to want to really memorialize uh, their field operations and hence the monumentality of those base towers compared to the cannon, but also the accuracy those, those towers would have, uh, would have provided. So in Scotland, yes, there are, there are baselines. Uh, Belhelvy, I think, is a baseline in, in Scotland. Uh, it would be interesting to know, um, to actually get out into the field, maybe, to look at the Ordnance Survey maps, to actually see. Um, but, um, and also in Wales as well, the, there was another baseline at Rutherland and the north coast of Wales. So they do exist outside Ireland, yeah. Great. Um, question from Diana saying, the Divis and the Cleesham Trig stations seem quite different. Do we know how variable trig stations were? And do we know whether pack animals were used? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, well, this is one thing I think we need from this field work, to be honest. Um, no, because the archaeology of the Ordnance Survey is in, is in its infancy. It, you know, I wrote an article on this about two or three years ago, um, but we have not yet got a systematic study of the field monuments of the Ordnance Survey. Um, so we do, it's very hard to know exactly um, what these, how these structures compare from one to another to another. Uh, and it would require field work on these summits and recording uh, using a proper archaeological survey of these field monuments. Um, now, the Divis, now, do you remember the Divis station has gone? Okay, so that, that plate that, um, that you were looking at in that, in that photograph that I took, um, that plate is um, created or put there by the modern Ordnance Survey of Northern Ireland as a kind of commemorative plaque. So we don't actually really know, unfortunately, what the Divis station really looked like uh, on the grounds. Um, but the Clisham one, we do, you know, because it is there. Um, so Divis, unfortunately, because the MOD cleared the site um, back in the 1960s, it, there's nothing much left in many ways would be better perhaps to look at Sleeve Snacks or Saul um, or Sleeve Donard for some of these Irish examples and comparing those. And that, as I said, is a task to be done. I have a question from Kate, which feeds into your, your plans for the future, which says, says, is there any work like this starting, is there any work like this taking place in England? Because we talked about Ireland, we've talked about yeah, well, a bit about Wales, but England. No, uh, well, uh, as you can probably tell from my accent, uh, that I'm not native to this island. Um, I hail from from the other islands. Um, I'm, I'm from the Midlands, so I mean, I, I certainly have a very close eye on on England. Um, but the answer to that, again, I'm afraid, is um, a part. There is a huge enthusiast um, interest in in England, um, and uh, one one can look, you can look at Twitter, social media. Um, and, and lots of lo lots of enthusiasts out there looking at these things in the landscape benchmarks and trig, trig points, trig pillars. Uh, less so the early early Ordnance Survey monuments, to be honest. Um, again, I think it's neglected heritage. I, I, I think we have yet we, the tendency with the, with archaeology in the Ordnance Survey is to look at you know OGS Crawford or to use the Ordnance Survey maps to identify maybe prehistoric monuments or Roman monuments, whatever but not actually think about the Ordnance Survey itself having an archeology span in the landscape. Uh, I think we're onto something new. And I think what I would like to see, I know I've stressed Ireland and Scotland in what I've been talking about, but, um, and to some extent Wales, but I really do think there's scope for a, 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 a project across the four nations, um, across these islands, um, which explores through community groups, through, through local history as well, and local archeology, span some of these landscape legacies. And I think that would be a really amazing project to have. Um, to, so, you know, Salisbury Plain, if Sue is still here, you know, Salisbury Plain, or how it can be, yes, uh, how it compares with Clisham and how it compares with Divis or, you know, these sorts of things, um, I think would be really, really instructive. But this is just the beginning. <laughs>
Um, so I, I am afraid sort of, uh, and to some extent, a bit of a lone voice. You know, I have published a bit on this, but you will not find a big literature yet uh, on the, on the archaeology of the Auden survey. So the work is there to be done. I think this is a good place to sort of butt in as well, to sort of say, there's a lot of work here and a, a four nation thing that's possible. But what we're hoping in the new year in 2021 is to use the Highlands as a pilot and to try to get people involved with doing documentary sourcing and then also eventually out in the field to look at them as well. But to use this as a pilot to learn how we could then take this out and expand it into the other areas. And it's a good way to also say, yes, we will have these workshops coming and yeah, the, the information will be on to the ARCH website tomorrow. It's not there yet. <laughs> but to also say, if you're really keen to get started, we put together a recording form and we put together a, a sheet on how to use the georeferencing on the National Library for Scotland. These are available on the ARCH website in the library. And I will send this round with a, the link to the recording when that gets put up. But there is scope for you to get started if you want to over Christmas and really start looking at some of these, these maps. But my question that goes on to that as well is I'm really struck by these documentary references you have, Keith. They're, they're fantastic. Are these online or do these require getting books out of libraries or getting to libraries? Will we be able to match what we're seeing on the, in the maps with the quotes like you've been doing? Yeah, yeah, they are and many, many of these sources. I mean, I don't, I don't think um, the early years of the of the audit survey by Charles Close. I don't think that is available actually online. But Portlock's memoirs of Colby that is available, uh, free to download. Um, I can find the links for, for those interested. Um, so, so yes, uh, and also those hefty volumes of the benchmarks and the trigonometrical stations and all of that stuff. But it's pretty dry actually it's quite technical but I love it um, all of that stuff is there you know it's, it's a matter of, sort of digging around on the internet and putting in a few few searches but a lot of it is there um, so uh, um, I mean we between ourselves and on the in the workshops then maybe we can we can actually pull some of that material together I'd be really happy to do that um, I'm interested in Diana Wally's um, uh, point about the Ordnance Survey name books for Northumberland. There has been a project in Northumberland actually on the Ordnance Survey name books. Um, I think it was National Lottery Heritage Fund that actually. It's Diana, you're there, I can see you. Was it not National Lottery Heritage Fund? Um, but uh, so, you know, there are there other kind of documentary sources. And I think that project was crowdsourcing, was it not, through the, the, the name uh book? Can I just answer? Um, yes, it was a it was a shoestring project actually, with some funding from the um, English Place Name Society. Ah, but yes, okay. we're we're nearly ready to go live with the material on on a website. But so right. the, the surveyors do sometimes refer to trig stations, but it's it's rather rarely, and they don't give as much detail. But but it is fascinating to see you know, to see the topographical side of what they're doing. Yeah, well. mm -hmm. and it's still another legacy of the operation of the Ordnance Survey. In Ireland, we have the Ordnance Survey Memoirs, they're called, the Ordnance Survey Memoirs. We also have name books and we have letter books. The Ordnance Survey Archive in Ireland is actually very good because it wasn't bombed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, we actually have quite a lot. Uh, it's mainly in Dublin now at the Royal Irish Academy um, and the National Archive here and the, the National Museum. So and we've all the Scottish name OS name books are described and digitised mm -hmm. on Scotland's places, and that's a fantastic right. resource. So, so there are there are these materials out there, absolutely, uh, Susan. And I think you know pulling some of this material together, um, some of those volumes I showed examples of, and also ways we can use them as well and relate them to the map resources and the aerial imagery, and also ultimately the field. I would love to be back in the field. Uh, I think for any field researcher, these past few months have been somewhat challenging. Um, you know, we can do a, quite a lot from the comfort of our own homes, but there's nothing like getting out there, is there? With our maps out in the field, you know, discovering stuff, recording stuff, um, you know, sharing it. That, that to me is the joy. So, so let, let's hope 2021 will be there. I mean, we also have the possibility that, I mean, yes, there are the old camps, but there's also newer trick points as well. And these should be recorded 
because they are our heritage, even though they're not, they're not perhaps seen, but they will be soon as well. So it's not all up on the top of mountains. No, 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 you're right. A lot right. of the this is, is actually accessible to us now. Yeah, indeed. The trig pillars actually, um, there is a re there's quite a cult following for those trig pillars. I mean, some of those things I've shown you already, um, those, those concrete pillars, there is a cult following and they can be found all over the place, not necessarily really in high up places. Mm. So actually in the lowlands, you know, so if I was, if we have anybody from East Anglia, you know, or from Yorkshire, um, you know, where there were fewer mountains and summits, then the, that the same theodolite was hoisted to the top of church towers. So, so the, the trigonometrical survey was ongoing right across Great Britain. Um, it didn't require those summit stations. And the benchmarks can be found absolutely everywhere. You know, we'll always find benchmarks. And it is, you know, going, it's disappearing. Yeah. It's disappearing. Yeah. Um, I just also, <clears throat> you know, are there any other questions? Any other questions that anyone has? We've pretty much gone through the, uh, the list and I see time is pressing. I, just wanted to add a comment as well, um, just to say here in Scotland, it's essential that you also look at the local HER as well as Cadmore, because they have diverged and there's a lot of local information, especially for the Highlands on the Highland HER. So it's a question of using, using both of those, I think for, for here. But I just wanna thank you for um, just a fascinating talk, Keith, really, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm inspired to start bringing up the maps and start looking and see what we can do. We've got the recording forms on the ARCH website so that we can systematically start gathering this information. I will be sending a message to everybody who, who booked for this with the link to the recording when it gets up and the start from these, these resources and how you can, can go for that. But I wanna thank you again, Keith, for just an absolutely sure. super, super talk. Thank and you. to remind people that, um, our next talk, the our next ARCH talk is Tuesday, the 26th of January, the day after our workshop, our map workshop. And on that, Lorraine Evans is going to speak about funerary, exploring funerary architecture and symbolism in the Scottish Highlands. So very different. We'll be looking at graves and grave, grave monuments there. But just basically to, to wish everybody to have a, a good holiday, a safe holiday. And um, yes, and hopefully we can get into the field safely and start exploring some of the, these monuments in the new year. So thanks very much, and um, we'll be in touch soon then. Thanks, happy Thank Christmas, you. everybody. Good to see you all. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>